I'm still getting lots of posts from people who think volcanoes emit more CO2 than humans, even after I busted this popular myth in my video, are humans contributing only 3% of CO2 in the atmosphere? So in this video, I'll track down the man who started the myth. And at the end, I'll explain why there's been such a long gap since my last video. Thanks for your patience. Let's start with this poster who claims that 40 volcanoes have been erupting under Antarctica and emitted more CO2 than humans ever have in just two months. And another, more vague claim that anthropogenic climate change is a boogeyman because, well, just look at the amount of CO2 produced by just one volcanic eruption. Which is fair enough, let's look. Take the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980, for instance. It was the largest eruption on the North American continent in nearly a century, so large it blew away the top of the mountain and sent an ash column 12 miles high. And it pumped 10 million tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Surely that dwarfs the amount of CO2 produced by humans, you would have thought. In fact, it barely touched it. Fossil fuel burning alone pumped out 19.5 billion tonnes of CO2 that same year. In other words, 2,000 times as much as Mount St. Helens. As for 40 undersea volcanoes emitting more CO2 than humans ever have in the space of just a couple of months, again, all you have to do is check the figures. That would be over 400 billion tonnes of CO2, over 6 billion tonnes a day, and that amount of CO2 bubbling out of the water around Antarctica would have been noticed not just by us using instruments, but by the penguins, who would have suffocated from it. As made-up stories go, this one really hasn't been thought through. As I showed in this video, one reason we definitively know the CO2 comes from burning fossil fuels is because it bears an isotopic signature that relates to oil and coal, not volcanoes. So watch that video to find out why. The information on how much CO2 volcanoes emit can be found with a simple click of a mouse button on the United States Geological Survey website. They're the people who measure and record worldwide volcanic activity. So the intriguing question is, if these numbers are so easy to check, why do people still believe this myth? And who started it? I tracked it back to a book written by this man, Ian Plymer. Ian Rutherford Plymer is an Australian geologist, explains this poster on Facebook, who tells us he's going to reveal some very interesting information on climate change that may shock many of you. Plymer's information on climate change doesn't come from a scientific study. He hasn't measured and re-evaluated the CO2 output of volcanoes. He isn't even a volcanologist. He simply makes two pronouncements in his book without giving any figures or citing sources, and then people unquestioningly believe it. Volcanoes produce more CO2 than the world's cars and industries combined. Volcanoes add far more CO2 to the oceans and atmosphere than humans. And that's it. That's the great thing about books. Books can make any claim the author wants without having to give a source or even give any figures. And a lot of people who are not the least bit sceptical of unsourced, unquantified claims are willing to believe it. It's interesting that when Plymer gives information in his book that's based on published scientific research, like the amount of CO2 absorbed by the oceans, he readily gives his source, where he throws in something he's made up, or believes, or incorrectly remembered, and not bothered to check, there's no source. Even Plymer could quite easily go on the internet and get the actual figures from the United States Geological Survey. In fact, Plymer's pronouncements have become so widely believed on the internet that the USGS even created a page with that very question. Do the Earth's volcanoes emit more CO2 than human activities, it asks. And the answer it gives is no. And unlike Plymer's proclamation, this is based on actual measurements published in scientific journals that can be checked. Plymer is a familiar face on TV chat shows and climate conferences, and a lot of people swallow whatever he says because his qualifications seem so impressive. Professor Emeritus of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne, Professor of Mining Geology at the University of Adelaide, 
and the director of multiple mineral exploration and mining companies. He's published 130 scientific papers, six books, and edited the Encyclopedia of Geology. Sounds pretty learned, stroke credible, don't you think? Well, yes, in his field, which is mining engineering, the subject he was writing about in those papers. But he's never published a single scientific paper on volcanology or paleoclimatology or glaciology. In those subjects, which he pronounces on, Ian Plymer is clearly out of his depth. We've had six major ice ages, and every single major ice age started when we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. Well, I don't want to quibble, but let's just correct this for the record. Two of those ice ages occurred in what's called the Precambrian, when the makeup of the atmosphere isn't very well understood. Very few rocks survive from that period. So Plymer can't say that CO2 levels were higher, we simply don't know. Nearly all of our geological knowledge comes from the Phanerozoic, which started with the Cambrian about 550 million years ago. It takes us from a time when there was no life at all on land, and continues all the way through the era of the amphibians, giant dragonflies, and through the age of the dinosaurs to now. And of the three ice ages during the Phanerozoic, only the late Ordovician had higher CO2 levels than today. But with that correction in mind, it's true to say there was indeed one ice age during the late Ordovician when CO2 levels were much higher than today. But this is already well known by paleoclimatologists, because they're the people that did the research and published this information, which is how it got into geology textbooks and then disseminated on the internet, which is how Plymer learned about it. In times gone by, when the carbon dioxide content was a hundred times the current content, we didn't have runaway global warming, we actually had glaciation. He didn't discover this himself, he didn't even learn it as an undergraduate, it's just public information that's even published on Wikipedia. So what exactly is Plymer's point? Well that's the thing, he doesn't make a point. I think he expects us to conclude that if CO2 was higher at a time when there was an ice age, then higher levels of CO2 can't possibly cause global warming. And that would be a fair enough conclusion, based on the minimal information he's given us. If I told you that my car went from New York to New Orleans on just one tank of gas, you might conclude it was incredibly fuel efficient. And that would be a reasonable conclusion, because I hadn't told you the whole story. Remember Potholer's axiom. If you think you figured out something based on widely available information, and it contradicts what researchers have concluded, then there are only three possible explanations. Either researchers are all incompetent, or they're all dishonest, or they know something you don't. And I'd encourage everyone to explore the third option first. So, is it possible that real experts in this field know something that Plymer doesn't? <laughs> OK, I'm sure you know where this is going, because I've covered this shop-worn myth before. What Plymer's not telling you is that all those past ice ages occurred when the sun was much weaker than today. That didn't matter as long as there were high enough levels of CO2 to keep the Earth warm. But when the CO2 concentration dropped, temperatures fell, triggering an ice age. Now, please don't tell me that temperature dropped first and then CO2 levels. You're confusing Phanerozoic ice ages with Pleistocene glacial cycles. I've done a whole video on that and also explained these different time periods in my video The Story of the Earth in 33 Minutes. So, is Ian Plymer failing to give you that crucial information because he doesn't know it? After all, he's never studied the subject, because when he was an undergraduate in the 1960s, the role of the sun and carbon dioxide during the Phanerozoic and the cause of ice ages weren't well understood. Or is he failing to give you that crucial information because he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes? That's not for me to speculate, but it has to be one or the other. Finally, there's this astonishing claim. Trying to argue that carbon gases shouldn't be treated as pollutants, Plymer said this, There are no carbon emissions. If there were, we could not see, because most carbon is black. If anyone thinks the Professor of Mining Engineering makes a good point, I'll have to explain that the term carbon emissions refers to gases that contain carbon. <laughs> 
The two that are most relevant to global warming are methane and carbon dioxide. But surely, as Plymer points out, if there were such a thing as carbon emissions, these gases would be black, because carbon is black. Well, firstly, no, only carbon in the form of graphite or amorphous carbon is black. In the form of diamond, it's colourless. In the form of fullerenes, it comes in a variety of colours depending on the length of the carbon chain. Carbon atoms themselves have no colour. The colour depends on how the carbon atoms are arranged. Secondly, when carbon combines with other elements, called carbon compounds, they produce a range of colours. Calcium carbonate is white. Copper carbonate is green. Methane and carbon dioxide are colourless. So the idea that carbon is black is wrong, and even if it was, the idea that carbon compounds therefore have to be black is equally wrong, and the idea that there are no carbon emissions because otherwise the atmosphere would be black is complete nonsense. Now again, I'm not suggesting Ian Plymer doesn't know this. After all, most of us learned this in elementary school, and as an experienced mining engineer, Plymer will be very familiar with carbon compounds that come in a lot of different colours. But here again is the conundrum, not just with Plymer, but with all these pundits, from William Happer to Patrick Moore. If Plymer is making incorrect statements about simple facts, like the amount of CO2 coming out of volcanoes or the colour of carbon compounds, then is he ignorant or is he deliberately trying to mislead people? And if it's the latter, what does he hope to gain by selling misleading books to a huge market of credulous readers at $21.34 a copy on Kindle? And why do people believe him when the figures clearly contradict him? I'm happy to admit that I came bottom of my class at school, and I'm nowhere near clever enough to be a university professor or write a scientific paper. But that's the point. If a dope like me can find information just by checking publicly available sources, then why can't these professors and learned stroke credible pundits who claim to be experts do it too? Believing pronouncements from people with titles who don't measure things and don't give figures is taking us back to the 13th century, a time when people assumed that women had fewer teeth than men simply because Aristotle said so. Bizarre as it may seem, no one thought to actually count the number of teeth and check. And that's the difference today between the blogosphere, which disseminates proclamations handed down from learned, stroke, credible people, and science, which is based on measuring and checking. Science is about counting the number of teeth, not believing whatever some bloke believes of the number of teeth, because that's what some other bloke told him. Finally, my apologies for the long delay in posting. I've been very busy since the end of the pandemic, and I was working on a video about mountain building in between assignments. Then I had a computer crash and everything was lost. The backup is in Australia, and right now I'm in Europe. I'll get back to that one in October. So instead I started work on this video, which has taken longer than expected. So yes, I'm still very much alive, but please expect another delay until I get back to Australia in October. I'm also working on a series, by popular demand, explaining how to sort fact from fiction on the internet, aimed especially at millennials. Don't forget that my videos aren't supported by advertising. I don't ask for contributions. My reward comes by donations to a charity. You'll find a link in the video description and I'm always kept informed of how well donations are doing on my behalf. Last time I checked, it was over 200,000 US dollars. My thanks to all those who've given, and I do know I need to fulfil my obligation, my side of the bargain, which is to make more videos. I promise I've got two assignments left in the Far East. I'll be back home by the end of October, and I will get stuck in. Thanks.